Bienvenidos a todos and welcome to CHCI's 2020 Health Summit session on digital health addressing the needs of underserved Latino communities. My name is Lily Eskelson Garcia. I am the happily and recently retired president of the National Education Association and so proud to continue to serve as secretary of the CHCI board. And on behalf of CHCI, I wanna thank Biogen, Uber, Genentech, and Eli Lilly and Company for their generous support of this session and an important session it is. Latinos represent a significant and growing segment of our nation's population, and yet many are caught in a cycle of vulnerability due to a lack of access to quality health care. As advancements in technology and the digital health sector continue to flourish, this session will discuss proven ways these innovations offer opportunities to empower vulnerable Latino populations to have better access to health care. But before we begin our panel, it's my privilege to introduce our panel host and our moderator for today. First, I'd like to introduce y dar un gran abrazo y bienvenidos to our Congressman Ruben Gallego. Congressman Gallego proudly represents Arizona's 7th Congressional District and serves as CHCI's board chair. He was the first in his family to attend college, graduating from Harvard University with a degree in international relations. He's the son of Hispanic immigrants, a veteran, and a community leader. And next, we are thrilled to have Alejandra Campo Verde as our moderator for this session. Alejandra is a nationally recognized women's health advocate, host of the podcast Pod is a Woman, and a former Obama White House official. She's founder of the Well Woman Coalition, an initiative empowering women of color to have agency over their own health and healing through awareness, education, and advocacy, and founder of Latinx uh, and BRCA in partnership with Penn Medicine's Vassar Center for BRCA, which is the first awareness campaign on the breast cancer gene mutation that targets Latinos and offers Spanish language educational materials. Very busy woman. I'm so impressed and so grateful. Welcome, Alejandra y que honor. I look forward to hearing from you and this stellar panel of leading experts and distinguished guests. And I know you're going to all enjoy this session. Don't forget to continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag CHCI Summit. Orale y adelante. Good afternoon, I'm Congressman Ruben Gallego. I represent Arizona 7th District and I'm the proud chairman of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Thank you for joining us today at the CHCI 2020 Health Summit and engaging in these discussions about the health and wellness of our community and of our nation. Part of CHCI's mission is to convene global and national leaders to engage and share timely, relevant information at events like this, where we can address some of the most pressing issues and, pre and present proven strategies around policy and practice to improve the quality of life for all communities, especially our vulnerable ones. Throughout this health summit, we've covered several topics focused on addressing health disparities such as mental health, access and affordability to prescription drugs, vaccines, and the implications of the Affordable Health Care Act. Latinos represent a significant and growing segment of our nation's population, but sadly, we're caught in a cycle of vulnerability and declining access to health care. Latinos are going to be, have to really find a way to have more access to health care in order to have better health care outcomes. But critical to these conversations is identifying solutions to break that cycle in order to achieve healthier outcomes, again, for our community. Among the solutions is to increase Latino representation at the decision-making table across all sectors when it comes to creating health policies, allocating funds, and ensuring equitable access to resources. And now we have seen the global pandemic has dr drastically transformed how we access our healthcare needs and who has access to those resources. The healthcare field continues to be a constantly changing environment with new and different dynamics and more complex challenges in vulnerable Latino populations. Through the introduction of telehealth services, cloud computing, and mobile devices, technology has the potential to transform access to healthcare and medical treatments for everyone. 
including Latino communities. Speakers in this session will discuss proven ways of leveraging technology to connect some of the most vulnerable Latino populations to better access to healthcare. Please follow us at CHCI on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and use the hashtag CHCI Summit. Thank you for your participation, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Welcome everyone. I'm Alejandra Campoverde and I will be your moderator for the last but not least panel of the CHCI Health Summit, Digital Health, Addressing the Needs of Underserved Latino Communities. Especially in times of COVID, we're seeing an increased emphasis on digital health for everyone's safety and rightfully so. But this presents an opportunity for us to explore how technology can contribute to better serving the Latino community that we know suffers from disparities in health across the board. This is a timely conversation and an important one, so let's get right to it. We have an exciting group of leaders on today's panel to discuss proven ways of leveraging technology to increase access to healthcare for some of the most vulnerable Latino populations. I'm going to call each panelist up one by one to introduce themselves, and then we'll open the discussion. And we'll save some time at the end for audience Q&A. Reminder, to, if you're enjoying this discussion, I encourage you to post on social media using hashtag CHCI Summit. First, I'd like to call up Robert Jaron, who is managing member at the Omega Concern. Robert, if you can take a couple minutes, introduce yourself, your background, and how you've come into this work. Welcome. You bet. Thank you, Alejandra. And thank you to CHCI for inviting me to this prestigious panel. Um, again, my name is Robert Jaron. I'm a strategic advisor to a number of companies and medical organizations in the area of digital health. Um, formerly, I worked for Qualcomm Incorporated, the world's largest producer of wireless chips, um, representing them in Washington, D.C. on federal matters uh, related to wireless health and uh, life sciences. Um, I currently also serve as an advisor to the American Medical Association. Uh, their digital medical payment advisory group, which is a group responsible for coding and code gaps related to digital medicine. Um, specifically, we worked on some of the newest remote physiologic monitoring codes, which went into effect a few years ago and have become pretty important given the fact that COVID has, has occurred and everything else. Um, so I came into this work, uh, really happenstance. Unfortunately, my mother, who is an Ecuadorian immigrant, developed ovarian cancer uh, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, actually. And uh, I moved overnight from working in uh, what I consider the capital of Latin America, Miami, uh, working on Latin American issues uh, straight into Washington, D.C. to help her with her illness. And at the same time, I was tapped on the shoulder to help the company with a new um, uh, uh, remote monitoring uh, project, which ended up becoming my life's work. Um, I never looked back. I stayed in D.C. and here I am today. So thank you again for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Robert. Next up, I'll call up Dr. Wanda Castro Borrero, who is Global Head Field Medical Excellence at Biogen. Hi, good afternoon, Alejandra and um, everyone. Um, very honored to be in this panel with uh, such a great group of people. Uh, thank you to CHCI for inviting us. I am currently Global uh, Head of Film Medical Excellence at Biogen. I've been at Biogen six years and in this role for only two months. I, before that, I uh, was the uh, multiple sclerosis MS franchise lead. I am a neurologist and pharmacist by training, and I've been at pharmaceutical industry for the past six years. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and um, as a physician and as a Hispanic, for me, it's very important to be in anything that has to be related to decrease health uh, disparities. Um, health equity is something that I'm very passionate about, um, part of a different work streams at Biogen to address this specific uh, topic. Um, I am also uh, very proud to say that Biogen is uh, well known for uh, diversity and inclusion. We are very proud to be a company that is all about the patients and we have multiple initiatives to um, decrease healthcare disparities or uh, as possible eliminate healthcare disparities on those treatment areas that we, that we lead. Thank you.
Uh, thanks, Alejandra, um, and for this invitation. Um, I'm a medical director in U.S. Medical Affairs at Genentech, and I recently served as a medical lead on an inclusive research trial, Impacta, in COVID-19 pneumonia. And that was um, really what inspired a lot of my uh, increased involvement in this space in terms of inclusive research and advancing health equity. And um, that emerging disparity that started um, earlier this year that we saw where um, patient communities of color were disproportionately affected by COVID pneumonia was really, I think, a wake up call for a lot of aspects of medicine um, in terms of trying to address um, health inequities. And I sit on the Advancing Inclusive Research and Health Equity team at Genentech. And several years ago, Genentech launched um, Advancing Inclusive Research, which is an enterprise-wide initiative that's focused on tackling disparities within clinical research with um, two main goals, really to ensure that clinical trial participants are represented um, of the broader patient population so that everyone with serious and life-threatening diseases has the opportunity to benefit from investigational medicines and also to enrich the understanding of clinical and genomic data to inform science and personalized healthcare. And the great work of this organization strongly aligns with our priorities. So I'm really excited to be on this panel. Thanks for the invitation. Initiatives for Uber Health. Thank you so much for having me today. And like Alejandra said, I'm Lauren Steingold and I lead strategic initiatives for Uber Health at Uber. I joined Uber seven years ago and because I had some healthcare experience prior to joining, it was pretty clear to me early on that Uber could have a significant impact in the healthcare space. I saw that access to, to reliable transportation is a key social determinant of health, that though it's common, it really disproportionately affects vulnerable communities like the elderly, low income, and chronically ill. Um, I even saw that one study showed that 3.6 million Americans missed a doctor's appointment every year because they didn't have access to a reliable ride. And while Uber has reliable rides in spades, many of the people that were missing those doctor's appointments don't have a smartphone or maybe even a credit card. And so we needed to create a solution that would enable a healthcare organization to request rides on behalf of their patients without needing a smartphone. So I proposed that solution to our executive team in 2017, uh, and we launched Uber Health in 2018. And since then, we've scaled throughout the US. Now over a thousand healthcare organizations across the country are using Uber Health to transport their patients to and from care. So I'm really excited to, to be here today and look forward to this conversation. As Chief Operating Officer of Eli Lilly and Company. Gracias, Alejandra. My name is Jenny Lopez, and I'm also from Puerto Rico. I moved here to pursue my master's in chemical engineering, and I've been working with Eli Lilly and Company for almost 19 years now. A lot of that time spent in manufacturing and quality and now in the business side, and it's been extremely rewarding. From my first job as a process engineer, really manufacturing insulin, it was rewarding for me because a lot of people in my family are diabetic. And then how 19 years after that, I am now in the connected care space for insulins, which is how we bring all of these devices together and transform medical care. So it's been really rewarding to see everything, how it's been uh, transforming in the diabetes space. I'm also very engaged with the Lilly ERG, the organization of Latinx. I am in the executive board and see how we can make the most impact for our employees, our patients, and our communities. Very humble and happy to be here. Thank you. start. So we're going to go into our question portion. I'm going to direct each question to one person to kick us off, but I want to encourage all panelists to weigh in on any question that's relevant to their work. First question is for Lauren Steingold. So how is digital health uniquely positioned to improve access for underserved Latino communities? Definitely. So I think when building technology, especially in the digital health space that is supposed to address barriers to care, we have to consider the diversity of the experiences in the communities that we're aiming to support. So at Uber, we think of this as meeting people where they are. So as an example, not all neighborhoods have public transportation, especially in more rural areas. Um, some patients, like I mentioned before, don't have access to a cell phone. Maybe they're dependent on landlines uh, or clearly require multilingual support. 
So for Uber Health, we built our solution so we can actually notify a patient of their ride details via a landline call or send them SMS messages in up to 44 languages. I think it's really important that organizations across the continuum of care really work together to build solutions to address these needs. Um, digital health organizations are uniquely positioned to do that because we're able to design with pain points in mind from the very beginning. Um, I think from a you know limitation standpoint, it sometimes is hard to get uh, patients to you know adopt these. Um, these new technologies because they're new, they're unheard of, and maybe you know there's lacking of trust. I think that's something we learned about from a partner of ours called um, Consejo Sanjo, who really works to improve patient engagement. Um, we found that really the, the provider and the relationship that they have in person, they can really help folks get more comfortable with these new technologies. And if we're thinking about it with these populations in mind, we really can create solutions that help them. Anyone want to weigh in? Perhaps Robert, I know you advise a lot of um, burgeoning digital companies. What do you see as the opportunity here specifically as a race to Latinos or related to Latinos? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, the, uh, I'll, I'll answer it two ways. So one thing, you know, one thing that COVID has been able to prove is actually that the Hispanic community is very well represented technology wise, um, you know, according to different uh, um, uh, research associations, including Pew, um, you've got 96% of the Hispanic population that owns a cell phone or a smartphone. I believe 79% of them own a smartphone outright. Um, you know, they, they do have access to broadband. The problem lies in with some of the policies that exist that are really actually quite restrictive. You know, so for example, um, when it comes to telehealth pre-COVID, um, telehealth has a number of arduous regulatory restrictions that disallow certain modalities from being able to be used. Um, you know, for example, the modalities have to be live voice and video in order to do an, a, a telehealth consult at all. So that really removes a lot of the different types of virtual care that are available right now that providers are actually quite resistant to using because there isn't really a lot of reimbursement, for example, that's a huge adoption to, you know, a, a huge barrier to adoption. Um, that is one of the areas that uh, the AMA has actually focused on is the coding gaps to be able to free up some of the reimbursement to be able to provide uh, substantive um, uh, uh, money uh, back to providers for you know providing these different kinds of services, including things like remote monitoring. Uh, so I so I see that you know the one thing that we did see because of COVID, you know, the, the curse and the blessing at the same time is that um, the uh, with the invocation of uh, the Stafford determination, as well as the public health emergency, we now have uh, a number of waivers that were instituted to try to free up these, you know, arduous regulations. So, for example, the modality regulation has now been rescinded for the time being during the public health emergency. You know, the same thing with the originating site. So now, in essence, a uh, beneficiary can, uh, you know, conduct a telehealth consult from their home or pretty much from anywhere. Um, but these things will expire the minute that the public health emergency disappears. And, and that's really, you know, was something that's that's something that has to be dealt with. You know, if there's a recommendation um, that I would that I would advise on, it's that, you know, there needs to be permanent regulatory flexibilities extended after the public health emergency, as well as payment changes in just the regular policies on reimbursement, which I can get into a little bit later. Well, you touched on adoption. I actually want to direct this next question to the two doctors on the panel. When we're talking about increasing adoption of new technologies for our community, what specifically as it relates to Latinos, what are the factors related to Latinos that need to be considered? Uh, maybe I can uh, take the first stab at this. Um, I think that building trust is really essential. When we talk about new technologies, we first have to show up in Latino communities in an authentic way, um, letting them know that we're attempting to build solutions that meet their needs um, and are tailored to um, essentially the values that they hold. That will allow us to build lasting relationships and have more culturally appropriate information available to them. Um, I think another recognition is also that um, Latino communities are very heterogeneous. So we learned this through our most recent clinical trial, um, Impacta, that not all um, 
Latino patients who participate in clinical trials, and we were able to enroll um, over 50% of our trial population was of Hispanic descent, but spoke multiple languages. And um, some of them might have been like recent immigrants versus first or second generation Americans. And their, their interaction with technology and adaptation to them um, are really unique. And I think that's something um, that having an understanding of that will help us build uh, better technologies and have stronger relationships with this community. I will agree with that. And the other point that I think is really important is uh, culture and history, right? So we know that there are different things that the Hispanic population has endured through the years. Um, within the United States and outside the United States. And something that I also believe is really important to understand is like we said Hispanics, but Hispanics is like this big blanket, right? And we are as diverse as the United States is. Um, when you look at those that live in the West Coast, those that are coming from Central America, South America, the Caribbean, we're very different among us. And we have, the, even though we have the same culture, same genetic background, it diverse and um, trust is one of the most significant things that we have to build in these groups. Um, in my experience, when I was in practice, I had a lot of patients that were Hispanic Latinos and they just wanna see me because I was able to speak the language with them, right? So cultural competency is another thing that we need to create awareness um, so providers have the tools to care for these patients. Um, uh, limitations, I will say that, um, uh, the previous answer about, about limitations, something that we talk a lot is about telehealth in the sense of um, seeing the provider and the patient face to face, but it is broader than that, right? Because as a physician, as a provider, you need to monitor the disease of that patient. So those are things that in our conversation, I would like to be talking later on and maybe each of us can, can get our opinions, but how can we also move away? It's not only see the patient and how you're doing, but how I'm gonna monitor, for example, my MS patient, I'm seeing them in this snapshot, but how it's gonna be moving further. Absolutely. Let's let's stick with barriers for right now, um, Jenny. I'm going to go to you because you know there obviously are a lot of barriers to digital health. We've already started touching on this, and I know we'll continue talking about it. But what do you see at the ones that need to be removed to increase access um, to using Absolutely. digital health technology, specifically for communities of color? I know you have particular expertise as it relates to diabetes. So what have mm -hmm. you seen? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think before we talk about barriers, I wanted to bring up the opportunity that we have in our hands. Like if you go back before 1922, you got a, a diagnosis of diabetes and it was almost a death sentence right away. And then with the introduction of insulin, as you've seen for the next generations, the whole focus has been how do we improve the insulins? How do we also add some oral medications to treat and manage diabetes and also the complications? And we are in a very exciting era uh, of optimization of care and also value. So in the 2010s, you'll see more of these connected devices, like the pumps, the connected uh, pens, the blood glucose meter, et cetera. So we have an opportunity when we have all of these devices talking to each other. So for example, if I'm a person you know, with diabetes, I have my, my insulin pen, or I have my pump, I have my blood glucose meter, or my continuous blood glucose meter, and it's talking to an app. And this app has a very sophisticated algorithm or calculation that is telling me is collecting all of this data, taking in consideration my own health factors in terms of uh, what I ate, my diet, or my exercise, and it's telling me what to do and when to do it. And it's a win-win for everybody, because for the person with diabetes, yeah, it's improving the quality of life, is removing a lot of that burden that comes with diabetes. In terms of complications, you are decreasing the short-term complications and the long-term complications, so less visits to the hospital, and in terms of the overall cost goes down significantly, significantly across the whole chain. So we have a huge opportunity in our hands, but the current systems do not allow for that. So that's where the barriers are. And just to have a little bit of thought on what we can do about that. An example is like, how do we insert more of these value-based agreements where the payer and the innovation company work together and attach the reimbursement associated with the effectiveness of this this uh, medical medicine, right? Uh, digital medicine, and also how uh, um, how widely adapted uh, it is, how people are using it, etc. 
and it's just helping the whole ecosystem. Uh, the other thing is reimbursement, just thinking about it differently because when it comes to digital health, uh, as a patient, there's like different uh, separate points. So for example, how do I start up my, <laughs> I decide to go into and using digital health. And the other one is like, how do I get used to it? So now it comes data and data analysis, and then how do I embrace the whole portfolio and then it's sustainable so I can get all the benefits from it. So how do we insert reimbursement into those specific points and also reimbursement for the HCP play, uh, payer, sorry, HCP. So that way they can get also reimbursed for their time and their expertise, how they're getting training, how to use these devices and how they're coaching also to use these devices. So again, we have a huge opportunity in our hands and it's how it takes, it's gonna take all of us together how to enable that. Anyone else want to weigh in on that question? Yeah, um, I'd love to. So, you know, it, it, the reimbursement thing is a, is a constant theme, and I, I can't reiterate that enough. And I, I think our providers, you know, from their comments, you can see, um, you know, pre-COVID, it was a very different world. You know, during COVID, we now have a lot of these, you know, waivers that I mentioned, the 1135 waivers, as they're called. It's 1135 because that's a section of the Social Security Act from where they came from. But, you know, all of those disappear literally the moment that the public health emergency is rescinded or that the Stafford Act determination is withdrawn. And that's a big problem because that will leave a lot of the safety net providers without adequate mechanisms to really provide telehealth consults, you know. There's a great um, uh, example of this with uh, with Ocean. It's the, um, the Oregon Community um, um, Health Information Network, which um, you know, works with a constellation of over 100 federal qualified health care centers and 500 providers, which, you know, pre-COVID, um, they would conduct less than 1% telehealth services. But due to the waivers, they were able to really ramp up on telehealth. And I think that at the height of it, they were conducting 70% of their uh, consults via telehealth. And, you know, and they are a safety net provider. They provide uh, technical assistance and support. Uh, to these federally qualified healthcare centers. Um, but, you know, if in fact the uh, public health emergency, whenever uh, it does get lifted, uh, you know, they all go back to being the same way that they have to provide, you know, live voice and video, for example, uh, telehealth consults. It has to happen in a, um, not in a metropolitan statistical area. It can only happen in a very rural area, including areas that federal qualified healthcare centers are disallowed from providing it. Um, you know, these are the utmost, most rural areas of the United States. Um, so this is an ongoing issue. And, you know, it's really important to also state that in the last three years, CMS made a very important policy declaration where they um, distinguish between telehealth and other forms of virtual care. Um, they very notably in the 2018 physician fee schedule said telehealth um, is, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, it is subject to 1834M. That's the, you know, again, the section of the law. Uh, which states that it has to be a certain modality, a certain uh, rural area, et cetera. Um, but remote physiologic or remote patient monitoring is not subject to those restrictions, um, which is why we now see the creation of CPT codes. These are professional services codes that can actually pay for, um, you know, remote monitoring uh, uh, done, performed on patients. So, so, you know, one of the biggest things that, that we can talk about is that, you know, and then, of course, we have this issue of the last mile of connectivity. The, the, the Federal Communications Commission, which is tasked with broadband and overseeing the regulations of broadband, does have a number of different uh, buckets of money, the monies that have been uh, provided uh, to be able to facilitate broadband for healthcare very specifically. And for years they had one called the Rural Healthcare um, a pilot project, but that was capped annually at $571 million. Unfortunately, that's a drop in the bucket for what that actually paid for because it was supposed to pay for infrastructure, which is something that typically um, hospitals don't you know, get involved in doing that. Hospitals care for people, they don't get into radio access networks. They then created the Connected Care Pilot Program, which was $300 million, $100 million annually for three years. And that does not, that covers broadband, but it doesn't actually fund end user devices or medical equipment. And most recently, because of the COVID um, uh, public health emergency in one of the interim legislative acts, 
there was the COVID-19 grant program for $200 million, which does cover telecom services and devices necessary for end users, but the 200 million evaporated within days. Um, so you can see that you know we, we have certain programs that are in effect that are supposed to help, but unfortunately they haven't done a good job of helping. You know, And I'll end with this. The telehealth, um, the, the, the telehealth regulations came from um, a statute enactment in the year 2000, back when fax machines were considered state of the art. And through rulemaking, CMS came out and said, look, you know, we're worried about fraud and abuse. Therefore, we're going to really limit, you know, what the modality is. Again, live voice and video, and it can only happen in, in not in metropolitan statistical areas and health professional shortage areas around the country. Um, you know, as, as far as well intended that may have been, it actually caused major unintended consequences because who lives in urban and suburban areas? You know, it's 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 many people in, in in especially minorities. So these minority populations were actually disenfranchised from being able to access telehealth in the process of trying to stem fraud and abuse. And it's an ongoing issue. You know, unfortunately, Congress is looking at this, and I think they're looking at this in an opposite way. In some conversations I've had with some offices, I keep hearing that they feel that digital health disenfranchises people, and it's like no, it's actually quite frankly the opposite. Um, so I'll end, that, I'll, I'll end that comment with that. Thank you. So we've touched several times on the broadband question, and I know, Lauren, you have some real practical on the ground experience about how this looks playing out on digital technology. Just some stats for folks. The FCC recently reported that over 21 million Americans do not have reliable access to the Internet. And a 2019 study from Pew showed that nearly 40% of Latinos do not have access to broadband internet. So Lauren, can you talk us through that transition and what that looks like reaching patients who may not have reliable internet access? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's so important that healthcare providers and payers, when they're looking for digital health solutions for their patients, that they work with organizations that have like considered this barrier from the very beginning. Um, I think that like it's it's funny that sometimes the technology that's created to solve problems really ends up being that technology is the barrier, the limiting factor that allows people to access it. And so um, for us, it really was like kind of outlandish to think about, you know, Uber, which is known for being this like thing that lives right here. Right. Like how do we give people ability to access it um, without our bread and butter? And so. It really, you know, we did a lot of um, user research and customer interviews to, to understand what those barriers are like and what the experience should be like. Um, and honestly, we actually, we did an eight month beta program before we launched so that we could really get feedback from our customers to understand is the solution that we created really addressing the barriers to care? And if not, we weren't gonna launch, right? So for us, it was like, give us that feedback, let us iterate and optimize our product to make sure that it actually addresses those needs. And so I mentioned- you heard? What were some yeah. of the things you heard in those studies? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, we knew that we needed to create a solution that wouldn't require someone having internet or an app. And so um, we did come out with, you know, SMS messaging because many people do have access to a phone where they can text. Um, but the, the language um, suggestion came in. I think at the beginning, we only had 20 languages. Now we have over 44. So we got information to say, hey, like we need this language and here's why, here's the population that you're trying to reach. I think another was um, that folks actually, if so when you are you know, at your home, you need a ride, you'll get an SMS message with the details of the ride. But when you're in a hospital or a care setting, you might get that information from the person at the front desk. And what we found was that oftentimes people were forgetting the details of the ride by the time they got outside, right? So maybe they had to walk around the corner and they forgot that the car was red or that it was a, a Hyundai. Um, and so what we did was we actually designed a, a paper PDF that these healthcare organizations now print out where they can write the name of the driver, they can circle the color of the car and give someone a physical piece of paper with the information for their ride. Um, totally not what we would ever expect Uber to do, right? To have something on paper, but it really, allowed us to meet people where they are. Um, I think that the other thing that um, really came to fruition from the input that we were getting was the need for landline calls. 
Um, and that really does come from the, the lack of access to, to internet and the ability even for some um, who don't maybe have the ability to like have SMS messages or who aren't comfortable with that technology, especially in an older population, to get a phone call and have it, it it's a robo uh, call that, that reads the information of the ride, but it has really improved um, our cancellation rates or someone actually being able to meet their driver. So I think um, it's both on the digital health companies and on the providers and, and payers who are working with these digital health solutions to, to really constantly be thinking about the patient experience and to think about how do we meet people where they are and, and to give feedback consistently, right? Like that relationship should never be stagnant. It should never be, oh, we signed a contract. Now we're using this digital health solution. There should always be an open line of communication where folks can say, hey, you know what? Like this isn't working and here's why. And it's on the digital health company to really think, you know what? We have to like consistently digest these suggestions and, and change our product roadmap, roadmap to make sure that we really are addressing these solutions. Let's talk about privacy for a second, because I know that's a hesitation a lot of folks have when it yeah. comes to digital health and their, their information and where that's ending up, who's going to touch it. What steps are being taken? I guess we could start with Lauren, since you were just talking about Uber's process. Yeah. What steps are being taken to protect patients and their health records? And then I want to open it up to the rest of the group. Definitely. I mean, patient information is arguably the most sensitive information about a person, right? And so the way we handle it is is so important. And, and for Uber, it was from day one, the first thing we thought about was like, how do we build this with HIPAA in mind? And how do we have the right HIPAA controls to make sure that whether it's someone using our dashboard, our API, or using one of our EHR integrations with a company like Cerner, how do we make sure that we always are doing that with the, the HIPAA secure solution in mind. And so we brought in the right experts from day one to, to help educate us and to make sure that we weren't just achieving a HIPAA secure platform, but that we were actually maintaining HIPAA security over time. And I think I know that this is important for a lot of digital health companies, but I will say what we found, and honestly, I hate that this is true, but especially in the COVID era, so many companies are like popping up with these new solutions and they're moving really quickly to make sure they're addressing needs fast but that means that they aren't always thinking about these things. And so um, I think patients, providers, payers, everyone should really consider that when they are thinking about working with a digital health solution. The ones that have done it right and thoughtfully are very proud of their, their HIPAA controls and their, their HIPAA security and will make that front and center on their website or will happily talk about all of the details of their HIPAA security program. And so going with those partners is really like the way to go. And the ones that are like, less, um, you know, confident or, or are a little bit, you know, less willing to chat about it, I, I would not be as willing to work with. So um, the ones that are, are proud of it, absolutely. I think those are the folks to, to work with. Dr. Mohan, would you like to weigh in on privacy and what you've heard and seen? Yeah, thanks, Alejandra. Um, I think that digital platforms have existed in one shape or another, like long before even the pandemic started. It's just really that now that we're um, experiencing social distancing and patients aren't able to come in for clinic visits, there's more telehealth and um, more digital platforms to kind of engage with the healthcare system in that way. And so more than ever, it's really important to reassure patients and specifically in Latino communities, their families because of shared decision-making that these digital platforms may be even more secure than non-digital tools. I mean, to Lauren's point, of course, there are some platforms that may be safer than others, but I think overall we wanna promote a sense of trust in them so that as we evolve and are able to reach more patients through digital technology, that there will be adoption of them. So physicians really need to understand that patients may wanna uh, make their healthcare decisions um, like through whether or not they adopt digital tools or technologies is really a patient level decision um, that occurs, but hopefully there, there will be more widespread adoption of them um, as, as it'll really increase access to care, um, access to clinical research and um, promote also education within these communities. But as we develop digital platforms, um, I think uh, something that comes to mind is just making sure that it's not just a matter of whether someone has internet access um, or the 
you know, the instrument like a computer or a smartphone to actually access the tool, but making sure that um, the language that it's written in is in one that they're comfortable um, reading or speaking or that icons are used also um, in addition to words so that for those who may have literacy issues may also um, still be able to engage with these digital platforms and tools. So I think really just being more holistic about our approach um, is important from the get-go. Great. Jenny or Dr. castro Barrera, do you have to, anything to weigh in on this question? No, obviously privacy is heavily integrated in the design of all of our digital devices now more than ever. That one and the other piece that is also very uh, integrated is uh, data security. We're making sure that we don't allow for any kind of breach into the system so everything is secure in the whole ecosystem. So it's, it's a, a primary factor in our design. And then the other thing to add to Dr. Mohan, uh, something that is going to be really key is how do we introduce simplicity into all of these solutions? Because even when a person, you know, gets diagnosed uh, with diabetes for the first time, it's overwhelming. It's so much to take into just a couple of minutes on top of being in a very uh, overburdened system. So it goes really fast in a language that you are not very familiar with. So how do you introduce simplicity in the solution, but also in the how do you educate uh, the patients on how to use these digital solutions. There is a really good uh, website. I think it's diabetes. Um, oh, I am blanking out right now, but the specific uh, website is just, for example, if I'm per first diagnosed, I need to know, okay, am I going with these devices and is it a pen or is it a pump? And then if it's at a pump, what kind of pump? It's just very overwhelming. So having this kind of simplicity is a start, the transition, and also in the language that than uh, diabetes wise that come. Uh, it is us in, in how you adopt this technology. So simplicity, very key. And as well, to build on that and, and what others have said, I will say that another thing that it's important is for each specific disease, um, there are certain tools in the digital space that are used that need to be validated on that disease, right? We know that there are different instruments and digital tools and patients would like to use it uh, no matter what their condition is but we know that those are validated for specific conditions so that is something that needs to be um, that it's important for them to be aware of so another piece of this I'll, I'll, is obviously with go ahead oh, i'm sorry so i was just gonna say i'll round out the discussion <laughs> Sorry, am I on? Yes, sorry. Um, I'll round out the HIPAA discussion or the uh, um, privacy and security discussion just by saying, you know, a good way of keeping tabs on um, the evolution of privacy and security and what patient rights are is just by looking at the law and the different enactments that have happened. You know, HIPAA was really for health insurance and it began in 1996. It wasn't until 13 years later through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act through high tech uh, that they strengthened it by giving stricter enforcement on privacy and security rules um, and mandating security audits on healthcare providers. Um, you know, fast forward six years later, you have the enactment of the Cybersecurity Act, uh, which was significant, significant for cyber related, um, you know, uh, mechanisms in cybersecurity information sharing. And then, you know, obviously, um, California being the leader in many things, uh, just through, you know, sheer size and volume, um, you know, the C California Consumer Privacy Act uh, went into effect in 2018, and they're still involved in rulemaking, I believe, or have just finished it. Um, and it's a very, very strong, uh, I would say, the strictest consumer privacy uh, and data protection measures in the country, uh, which rival those of the GDPR, which has, you know, happened in Europe in between all of this. Um, so you can see this evolution of really beginning to try to protect the consumer because the consumer unwittingly or unknowingly may be sharing many aspects that they can never get back. You know, to go back to my fellow panelists' comments, you know, it is one of the most um, sensitive areas because once the information gets out, you can't bring it back in, um, you know, and as well, you do see uh, the Office of the National Coordinator and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, Services themselves trying to actually free up um, health data and making it more accessible to those who actually own it, which is the consumer and the patient, right, through the ONC's information blocking rule and then CMS's interoperability and patient access rule, which went into effect but have been delayed as a result of COVID. So I think a good way of looking at the consumer protections that we have is looking at the body of law and seeing how that law is evolving. You know, at the end of the day, regrettably, 
you do get a lot of you know questionable characters out there that are selling questionable services or or even things like apps and you know un unknowingly consumers will consent to something because all they want is access to the product and they have all these end user licensing agreements that they just kind of click off on you know i would ask everybody on the panel how many times have you actually bothered to actually read line by line any of those consent forms you know once you consent to something you're giving them the authority to do whatever they want to um, basically, you know, with your information, including posted, you know, um, publicly. Um, so in a big way, it is buyer beware, but you, you see the law beginning to really strengthen and ratchet up and try to protect the, the unknowing consumer. Well, let's talk about how this data collection can actually um, improve the treatment experience of underrepresented populations when it comes to health equity. Dr. Castro Barrero, can you speak to this? Because there is a lot of data now on disease, on, on um, symptoms and so on that can possibly help us community-wise be able to track you know, best practices. Yeah, so I would say that one of the most significant things is um, create awareness on the disease state, right? And I will give an example in multiple sclerosis for um, as is the one that I'm more related to. Um, we know that Hispanics um, have a different disease than their white and black counterparts, right? So one of the main things that we have been doing at Biogen is creating awareness and real world evidence, generating data um, related to Hispanics, African-Americans, and that they relate to their uh, counterparts. And we have done this uh, with real world evidence with something that it is the MS Path or MS Partners Advancing um, Technology and Health Solutions. And with this, we collect data and it's also related to the previous questions. We collect data on what is the MS performance test. Um, the patient goes to the clinic and have these digital solutions to measure cognition, how they walk, how they ambulate, their dexterity. And with these things, we uh, improve the data collection. Recently, we published uh, at the ECTRIMS meeting some data on Hispanics specifically. And um, we also utilize the NARCTRIMS um, database to show that Hispanics um, are 40% of them are on treatment. So you have another 60% of patients that are not on therapy. Um, we collect all this data and there is specific privacy issues. We also have another tool that is the Cogival, um, and this is an app that is used by healthcare providers in their iPad, um, it's at no cost. And with this, they can monitor how their patients are doing cognitively. So we know that um, there are different implications in these chronic diseases, and we need to create awareness of the disease. And then how we collect the data, right? So we collect the data in different forms, and we need to make sure that the patients are um, well aware of the way that we collect the data and how we um, provide this data otherwise. What we use with their data, basically. Jenny, do you want to weigh in on how this relates to diabetes as well? I know you have some personal experience with that. Oh, you, I think you're muted. I haven't touched oh. anything. <laughs> oh, there you are. We can hear you now. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> well, I haven't touched anything. No, uh, yes, uh, what well, we all have talked about, right, how... Um, disproportionately were impacted in many diseases. COVID-19 being one of them, uh, diabetes is the same case. And uh, it, it makes you think, why is that? And I wish I can be here and tell you it's only one factor. It's uh, different factors that feed from each other and also compound the situation, making it very complex. One of them, as a Latino community, we have a high higher rate of people who are not covered by this insurance company. So access is very difficult. The other piece is, uh, we, I think Dr. Wanda Castro Borrero mentioned the cultural traits that come in play. Um, family is number one, and you prioritize everything, family first, and then everything else later. So <laughs> part of us, we are very um, optimistic, and we say, oh, this will pass, or whenever it gets really bad, that's whenever I'll get to it. So we delay the, the treatment. Also, we respect, there's a paternalismo and respect, so we really respect what the other members of the family mentioned or what the doctor says. 
Um, and if they are not going, they're not introducing some of these uh, new technologies, then there is no awareness. So the combination of all of these factors is um, causing something that we call diabetes clinical inertia. So that means that the patient either does not stop treatment or does not uh, uh, intensify it. So after going many years without being in that glycemic control, then it causes a lot of complications and these complications can be very deadly. So for example, one complication of diabetes is end stage uh, renal disease. We are, our rate of that is 47% higher for Hispanics and Latinos than any other ethnicity. As uh, diabetic Latinos also were 1.4 um, more likely to die from diabetes from other ones. So you can see wh how all of these factors, right, compound each other. So that's why really having access to these technologies is so important. Uh, there are many different things that we can do. We can have really targeted campaigns that help educating the person with diabetes. I don't know, we can call it SMI Tiempo or something like that, but really empowering them to bring this to the HCP and then empowering also the HCP on how to best care for the Latino patient. And then they can figure out what is the better path forward. Uh, there are also other like state navigator programs in some states where they are um, community health workers that help really bridge in that gap and really educating uh, how do we get the patients understanding how we can get access to them, how we they can understand what solutions are out there, not only from medicine, but then the, te the technology, from well-being, et cetera. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because there is need for research to be done in terms of how all of these elements play together, because the learnings that we get are going to inform us in how to best help uh, access, how to best change for care, how to best design our system so we can be very tailored for the Latino community. It's gonna take more than just uh, translating things into Spanish. It goes beyond that. So having that understanding is gonna be really key in how we really move the needle with, within a community that is heavily impacted by this. That's absolutely like that. right. And that segues well into the quality of care um, conversation that I want to open up to the group. I was hoping each of you can weigh on, weigh in from your different perspectives on this. Because when we're thinking about digital health, you know, when you're seeing a doctor on a screen, whether or not you're able to interact in person, like how does the quality of your actual care decrease or does it not? And what digital health tools and systems either are being put into place or need to be put into place to make sure that this is as effective as possible for patients. So if we could just go around, that would be great. So yeah. I can give a, a little bit of a view. Um, you know, as a neurologist, and I, I haven't practiced in the past six years, right? Um, but I have some colleagues. And one of the things that we said is, what is a neurologist without a hammer? Right, because when you are training, you need to have a hammer and you have to get those reflexes and that will help your 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 point of view. So when you are doing a telehealth or visit like what we're doing right now, I'm not gonna be able to do or, or my counterpart neurologists that are in practice, they cannot check reflexes on the patients. They're you they have to adapt the neurological exam to this new era. Um, and then they need to rely also on some digital tools to monitor patients, um, which is going to be COVID has has brought us to the new era very quickly. Something that we are evaluating at Biogen is a tool called Connectum that help us. Um, it's in a cell phone and if validated and approved, it will give us more insights about how the patient is walking, how the patient um, cognition is, how their manual dexterity. And those are the things that in this virtual setting, I cannot measure on my patient, right? Um, so we we know that quality of care, um, a lot of the providers are working into this and making their best effort. Um, many of the institutions have now how to do a virtual neurological exam, which is very interesting. Um, so I think that is one of the things um, that will keep coming to the future. Yeah, I, I can add touch a little bit. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just wanted to add a little bit that um, in terms of when we move to kind of virtual physician visits or virtual engagement with patients, I think it's that much more important to make patients part of the process. Um, to your point, Dr. Castro Guerrero, if a patient doesn't use those um, virtual tools, then, you know, like trying to explain the value of the tool or how you're going to use that data, making that data available also to the patient so that they can understand 
you know, kind of what you're looking for or if there are any objective measures of success or tr failure of a treatment, um, those allow patients to be more partners in their healthcare and the process than um, just being kind of a, maybe for, it might feel more like a guinea pig, like, oh, I'm just gonna test these tools on you and wanna validate them. But really the intent is to provide better healthcare even in the absence of a face-to-face -face visit. And to that end, I mean, even the solutions that we um, that we try to develop with respect to digital technologies, like I think that just collecting data, like there are many routes of collecting data um, from patients, but making sure that that cycle is completed with return of the data to the patients themselves um, to allow them to learn from it and um, to be assured that their data isn't going into some sort of vacuum or being used in a way that they're not aware of, but that it is contributing to scientific progress and helping other patients like them. And I would like to add something that reminds me something that Jenny said previously. Um, Hispanics usually make decisions as a mom, dad, the elderly, everybody, right? And when you have this telehealth and virtual, you need to allow the other members of the family kind of to play because if not, you're going to be talking to the patient and the patient is not going to make the decision until they talk to the others. So how you can bring multiple uh, panels like in here. So the son and the daughter and everybody's there um, to weigh in and that will improve how the patient feel that is getting the best care during those appointments. So. That's good. And, and I touched a little bit on this and we've been focusing on telehealth, but also when it comes to digital health, it expands, right? It expands into the devices as well. So I know it's very exciting the work that we are doing at Eli Lilly and how to integrate all of this. So it's a really, simple experience for the patient how do we bring everything together the again the the pump the pen the blood glucose meter the continuous gl glucose meter the app with the um, algorithm the calculator and then how do we also connect with the electronic health records so everybody gets the data i'm empowered to make decisions but if i need to call my doctor to consult he or she is already looking in front of them exactly how am I doing and what is not really based on a piece of paper or like maybe I remember I did last time it's all on time data and then also we'll have a version for the caregivers just as Dr. Wanda Castro Borrero was saying is it's really important for us as a family to everybody making sure that we are taking care of each other so it's very exciting it's, and uh, that's something that we're working on. I think the last thing that I would add is that like, I absolutely agree with Dr. Mohan. I think that like communication is everything. If we can find ways to like improve uh, the understanding of like how to use the technology or um, what to expect when it's coming, um, I think that folks really are just a lot more willing to adopt it. Um, and for us as a team, we've been thinking a lot about just adherence in general and how can we use the technology to really improve adherence at different touch points so whether that's like actually taking the ride to get to care or in, especially in a COVID environment, we've thought about adherences. It comes from like a, a medication adherence standpoint. And if we're able to deliver a sandwich using the Uber Eats platform, how can we repurpose that and think about prescription delivery? And that's something that um, we try to look at a patient more holistically rather than trying to address a social determinant in a vacuum, right? Like, oh, we can check the box on transportation. But if you don't think about whether or not someone is following up on the care that their provider has prescribed, whether that's with treatment, further treatment or with medication, then like you're not really addressing those social determinants. And so um, we have started to pilot prescription delivery as a result, which is really exciting. But um, I think that really thinking about a patient holistically um, is how we're going to overcome barriers like this. So. Now, Alejandra, the last thing I would add is that when, when talking about social determinants and care coordination and really, you know, the benefits of digital health and trying to really do a, a holistic care management, um, you know, you have to really kind of look also at the at doctors and doctors' acceptance of digital health. Um, the American Medical Association has conducted a series of polls beginning in 2016 on uh, the adoption and acceptance of digital health tools in practice. And you see that between 2016 and 2019, it's grown from 26% to 
3%, but that's still only a third of providers. Now, this is obviously pre-COVID, um, but, you know, it's, it's very indicative of the slow rate of adoption. You know, the culture change has to happen, happen not only in, with the practice of medicine, but also obviously with the users and patients and beneficiaries and even, you know, um, those involved in, in the care of families and loved ones. You know, and I will say that there are many other policies that are in effect, which really disenfranchise large portions of the community. Um, you know, federal qualified health care centers, for example, FQHCs, uh, they're given a, a very different payment structure than others under Medicare Part A, B, C, et cetera. Um, their payment structure gives them an all-inclusive rate for um, including all kinds of different services. Um, most recently, CMS decided to actually include in that all-inclusive rate care management services, but they excluded remote monitoring, which doesn't make much sense because that is a care management service. Another one is with the MDPP. We're talking about diabetes. This is the Medicare Diabetes Pre um, Prevention Program. Um, that program is literally made to be virtual, but CMS does not allow virtual MDPP still requiring face-to-face -face consults. They lifted some of them for COVID, um, which really just proves that they should just be virtual. However, that isn't the case, and they don't use or they don't um, allow the utilization of MDPP under Medicare Advantage plans, which also is just a miss. So there's there's a lot of culture change and a lot of policies that could actually help with that culture change that have to be uh, you know taken care of. Well, thank you for that because you just set up perfectly our final question. We have questions from the audience that are pouring in, so we want to make plenty of time for that. But we have a very distinguished audience right now, policymakers and folks involved in industry, as so we want to take advantage of this opportunity to talk about what policies we can put in place. What do policymakers need to know when it comes to bridging the digital divide, being able to clear the way to leverage these technologies while protecting patients' privacy? And I want to um, direct this one to Dr. Mohan. Um, thanks, Alejandro. Um, Alejandro, I think that um, when we look at digital technologies and partnering with policymakers, um, the first aspect um, to consider is building tools and technologies that patients actually want and um, will use and trust, because ultimately that will accomplish the goal of um, making scientific progress. And that takes all of us working together. So, um, you know, working with policymakers to find out like what the, the rules and regulations are, first starting with patients and asking what kinds of platforms or tools or ways that they want to engage with um, healthcare providers. And then also working with um, sponsors and industry so that as we go through and create clinical trials for research that um, we are including the patient voice um, from the start, whether that's through, you know, designing trial endpoints that matter to patients and um, also, you know, creating study design that um, that really focuses on something that reduces barriers for them. We touched on a number of, you know, potential unique features um, of the Latino community, including, you know, family shared decision making, um, challenges with transportation um, or, you know, reliable internet connection or access for virtual visits. So there are lots of unique features that I think that we can partner on across different disciplines. Wonderful. Okay. Well, let's I'm sorry. Um, no, I was going to just mention that um, something, not necessarily with policymakers, but something that we have done at Biogen is to increase the voice of the patient. We are we have a community advisory board with Latinx and uh, Black African American patients that can help us understand um, better what are the needs when we talk about clinical trial research. And we also have a dedicated team for patient engagement in R&D research and development to understand the voice of the patient um, when we're designing clinical trials. And we think that that is key. And while we'll talk with policymakers, we also need to include the patient's voice. Thank you for adding that, Dr. castro Bolero. And if folks see me looking at my phone, it's because that's where your questions are. So that's what I'm doing. Um, the first question that came through was for Lauren, um, any thought or efforts that you've placed into collaborating with payers regarding reimbursement for travel and specifically medical travel? Yes. Uh, so Uber Health is actually widely used to provide uh, NEMT or non-emergency medical transport for the Medicare 
uh, and Medicaid population. So um, it really is uh, for folks that are elderly, low income, and, and really um, more likely to be in that like vulnerable group. So um, we absolutely are uh, accepting reimbursement in, in a number of cases um, and do work with a number of payers, both directly and through our relationships with those non-emergency medical transportation brokers. Um, so often we might have the relationship with the broker and then they are then reimbursed by the payer. Um, in other cases, um, there actually are healthcare organizations, whether it be a hospital system or um, you know, a, a specific care facility that is more than willing to um, pay for the cost of the ride just because the someone not showing up to their appointment really does cost them them so much on, on the other side of that. And so um, mm -hmm. that happens quite a bit. And then there also are other um, programs where there's a lot of grant funding that helps to, to pay for the cost of these rides as well. So Uber Health specifically, um, because we partner with healthcare organizations, we actually bill the healthcare organization for the ride. Um, the, the patient is never billed directly for that ride in the same way that you would be if you used the Uber app. Thank you, Manny, for that question. Our next question is from Yvette Maldonado. She says, speaking of privacy restrictions, so many of our Latino patients rely on their children to translate not only the language, but medical jargon for them. How can the technology and programs make it feasible for us to continue to fill that role for our parents? Great question. Who wants to jump in on this one? That is such a great question, and I feel like I should say something only because I, I was that person, except I was older. Um, you know, when my mom got diagnosed with ovarian cancer, um, you know, I was I was in well in my career, um, as I mentioned, working in in Miami on spectrum issues, and I moved overnight to D.C. to help her. And I, I didn't realize that you know cancer obviously affects the person, but it it also, you know, destroys everything in its path and everybody, you know, I, I moved permanently to DC. That wasn't something that I was planning on doing. And it was mostly because my mom, um, you know, had certain language um, deficiencies and, you know, wasn't uh, always so comfortable understanding medical jargon and all of the things that needed, you know, to be in place for her care. It was very intense. You know, we had everything from the, you know, the specialist to the infusion center to the radiology center to, you know, and everything in between and coordinating that really took an incredible amount of time. You know, at the time I was working at, at Qualcomm, it was incredible that my employer said, yeah, sure, relocate and don't worry about it. You know, take, take calls from the emergency room from, you know, the surgical center, doesn't matter, you know, it's, we're, we're a wireless company. But nobody has that, you know, capability. I mean, that doesn't exist. And not everybody has a son who works in healthcare and is a lawyer that can understand, you know, this, you know, very complex set of circumstances. Um, I wish there were an app out there. I wish there were a technology. I, I don't know of any of them. It's really one of the reasons why I got involved in healthcare because as I was going through this with my mom, I realized that there were these massive deficiencies in our healthcare program. Um, you know, I will say this, the more that I learned about my sector, the more that I realized that things are in place that try to help mitigate these types of barriers, you know, for example, um, medical device manufacturers have to undergo good manufacturing practices. And part of that includes usability testing and, uh, you know, human factors testing. Some of them do, you know, heavily go into the realm of, um, you know, ethnic uh, differences, uh, et cetera, you know, because they want to make sure that they get the culture right so that the person understands how to use these medical devices in the most, you know, coherent way. Um, but that doesn't affect all manufacturers and lots of manufacturers, unfortunately, don't even, you know, um, contemplate those things um, in what they're making. And, and this is outside of the medical device realm. Um, so that that is a really, really great question. I feel the pain of that question. Unfortunately, my mom lost her battle with uh, with cancer four years ago. Um, you know, but it's uh, it's something that's I feel ongoing. And, you know, I'm not quite sure we'll ever get there. I don't know if there's a there. But thank you for that question. Great question and something that needed is more cultural competent healthcare sites. If you have uh, sites that are culturally competent, they will be having those translators for any language that you need. They will understand um, the community um, and they will also look for ways that the family is involved in the care. So that is something that, um, and what I have seen is resistance in some healthcare providers. They believe that they are culturally competent, but I think 
everyone can always learn a little bit and, and in, make it more inclusive. So I could add to that um, kind of from the, the clinical trial angle and incorporating um, patients, families, and children kind of into that process. So we just recently completed enrollment of the IMPACTA study, which was um, a study in COVID-19 hospitalized pneumonia patients. And you can imagine in the middle of this pandemic, families were actually not able to be in the hospital with their loved ones. So the whole consent process um, that happens is kind of disjointed because there's a patient in isolation. There's not necessarily a translator that's even able to get into the room. And then you have family members that you have to kind of telephone or conference in. And um, this was really our first trial that focused on recruiting predominantly underserved minority communities. So we came up across this, this specific type of challenge of like, how do we incorporate family members um, and their, their decision making into this process for consenting? And we, we came up with um, a lot of inventive solutions that we offered to sites. And the sites themselves were not necessarily ones that typically participated in clinical trial research, but were really embedded in the community. And I think that was like one of the the ways that we succeeded in being able to enroll over 85% of these patients were from a minority background and over half being Hispanic was because we engaged the community-based hospital, those healthcare providers, and many of them um, had the same cultural background or ethnic background as the patients they were serving. And this allowed them to have that kind of built-in understanding of what the patient really needed. And despite the fact that it was a pandemic and relatively chaotic, um, we're able to really bring some layer of comfort and trust to the community as a result of that. So I think there are great opportunities to incorporate uh, children into the decision making process and really just being aware that that might be something important to the patient is where to start. Did anyone else want to weigh in before I move to the next question? Okay, the next question is um, anonymous. How can nonprofit partners collaborate with the health industry to bridge the digital divide that is a huge barrier for communities to access digital health? So how partnerships can bridge this divide? Who wants to take this one? So I could possibly start on that. Um, I mentioned in the introduction that we have a company-wide initiative around advancing inclusive research. And part of making progress towards that um, was to build an external council of diverse expert advisors to partner with us. And I think it's really important to co-create and develop solutions with the communities that we hope to reach. And so that's another opportunity for um, sponsors to build relationships with nonprofits or patient advocacy groups to get their input um, and be part of the solution. One thing I'll add is that- if I can, sorry. Oh, Go for it. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Who's going? Go Lauren. Should I Okay, uh, I was just going to add that uh, at Uber, one example is that we do offer uh, community grant programs where organizations, nonprofits who um, work with specific populations are able to apply for grants where they're able to take advantage of free rides or free deliveries of, of healthy meals and, and things like that. Um, and it's something that, especially on the Uber health side, we're very eager to do more of. Um, so I would definitely encourage more organizations to, to apply and partner with us on those fronts. Um, and it is something that I do see a lot more digital health companies looking to do. Um, we have these, these capabilities and our ability to, to share them more broadly is absolutely something that we're consistently looking to do. So more, the more the merrier. The one thing that I would add is, um, you know, given the fact that we have such a sensitive time in our in our country, um, there has been, you know, increased um, focus um, by both the vendor community, industry, et cetera, uh, in, you know, how to bridge this racial divide. And there um, recently the Consumer Technology Association, um, of which I advise, um, as well as the uh, Connected Health Initiative from um, uh, an organization called ACT, um, the Apple Alliance um, created something called the Health Equity and Access Leadership Coalition. Uh, and I believe that there are a number of um, um, non-industry stakeholders, which goes to the question that was brought by the caller by the anonymous caller. 
you know, they're, they're not the only ones. There's also something called the CEO action for racial equity um, uh, effort that's going on uh, where they're trying to come up with, you know, creative ways of really involving the community as well as industry um, to find, you know, adequate solutions to what's going on in this country's, you know, racial divide and in particular in healthcare. Um, I see more and more focus in this area, which I think is really, really great, more than I've seen before. So I'm hoping that it'll come out with, you know, very substantive policy aim aims that can be worked on. Okay, we have a question from Linda. How can we ensure older patients who may not be tech savvy take advantage of digital health if physically visiting a doctor is not feasible? I want to speak to your experience patients using Uber Health? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, again, I, I hate to go back to like not needing to have a smartphone, but I think that that's something that really has improved our ability to reach uh, older adults. Um, I think uh, we also have partnerships and, and the ability to like call a 1-800 number to be able to request a ride. Um, I think that that's something that has really been game changing for, for older adults as well. Um, and then we go back to really a family unit, right? And, and communicating with um, the children of these patients and with the folks that are, you know, considered to be their caretakers is really, really important. Um, I think that like we just can't ignore that fact and, and really um, going beyond just the patient and thinking about, and this is obviously for, for providers as well, to, to make sure that um, the person on the other end of the screen is, is really um, comprehending and understanding the the care and the um, sort of recommendations going forward and and asking for involvement of, of other um, family members as well. I know um, another thing that's happening right now in a care setting, um, and I had a, a doctor's appointment um, last week that was one that I couldn't do virtually, but um, I had the, the option to FaceTime my husband into the session, right? And that um, was so comforting because when someone especially is like going through a healthcare issue, right? It's scary. It's overwhelming. There's anxiety that comes from that. Having a partner or family member on screen um, and and giving them the ability to be like, oh, don't forget this part of your medical history or, oh, I have this one other question that we discussed previously um, really does open them up to, to feeling more cared for and to, to thinking through that scenario. And I'm, I'm not an older adult, but I know that um, that's something that really um, could be offered to, to more patients and something that I think would help people feel more comfortable with their care plan going forward. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? I could say that, you know, based on my family members, right? Um, my dad and my aunt, something that I, I feel they're more comfortable after I have teach them is to use the smartphone. So if it's a telehealth that they can use the smartphone, it's usually better, at least for all of them. The only problem is that you keep it, put it in the, to hear in the, in the ear. So you just see their ear instead of their faces and you have to keep reminding them. Um, but I think that could be a potential ways. And as you said, uh, Lauren, the children are the ones who have to teach them because I have to teach my dad and my aunt and how you're going to be using the, the devices. Absolutely. That's a role that we particularly play in our families in the Latino community. I know that there's four generations of breast cancer in my family, and it's been very much um, a relay race of everyone helping older and helping younger. So that's um, definitely important. All right. We have a question from Jose. What digital health tools and systems are being put in place to measure the effectiveness of care outcomes? Systems being put in place into measuring yeah. effectiveness. So, 
So I will I will speak to this only from the perspective of medical devices, only because I think it's important to, to note what is going on with the Food and Drug Administration. Um, you know, the Food and Drug Administration has several um, areas, obviously, that they that they oversee, including medical device and medical device manufacturing. Um, but one prime area that they really have been interested in in the last three to four years um, is this notion of real world evidence, which was mentioned by one of my colleagues. Um, you know, real world evidence and real world performance is a very important step in the future of medical device clearance and approvals only because the FDA is considering right now something called a pre-certification um, program where they're trying to expedite how software as a medical device can make it into the hands of users without having to go through the typical regulatory, um, you know, very time consuming process, um, particularly because software in and of itself by virtue of being software is something that changes literally by the minute sometimes, you know, it's constant patches, constant updates, cyber vulnerabilities that have to be dealt with, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole idea behind that is the creation of something they're calling the total product life cycle, which really contemplates that as this device gets released into the public for commercial application, um, all of the information that's coming back into uh, the software, how it's being used, problems, you know, any issues that come up, hiccups, et cetera, are being fed into this process that the FDA and the manufacturer or the producer will be, will be mitigating in real time. And that's a really novel thing. That's not something that's ever existed before, but it's predicated on the idea of real world evidence. And I think that that's got a lot of practical implications for just everything from, you know, how software is manufactured to actually even how hardware is manufactured and, and services in between. You know, this notion of real world performance and real world evidence is, is really important to note. And I think that it also speaks to the future of things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, which, you know, unfortunately at this point uh, seem to be very racially biased. You know, there was a report that was written in the journal Science where you know, I'm not going to name the, 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 the insurance provider um, had developed an algorithm where they had taken 50,000 patients, yet 44,000 of the patients were white in a very predominantly, you know, racial, racial area. So, you know, that shows a particular bias because it was not contemplating certain, uh, um, you know, conditions that are not indicative of, you know, the 44,000 people that they had, you know, included in the, in the 50,000 end. So, so that, you know, th this is all part of, you know, how these, uh, you know, devices and services are really beginning to iterate um, based upon what's happening in real time. And I think that's, that's, you know, vitally important for healthcare. Yeah, and just a little bit to add on that, obviously the whole mission of our, our whole connected care space is to improve outcomes. <laughs> we have a very measurable goal of getting everybody to 100% of time in range. Uh, obviously, what you do that is you measure how the different generations of these devices are getting you to the target so we can improve the outcomes of our patients. And that's why I mentioned before the, um, the need for these value-based agreements because that way they're holding each other accountable for these outcomes are expecting. So again, that's our whole mission to improve outcomes. We have time for one last question. I apologize for not getting to all the questions. It's from Yvonne Garcia from Georgia. Much could be accomplished with digital health and a digital savvy community, but can this initiative work effectively with distrust of government and large corporate entities that operate digital health programs, especially when private information is exchanged? The Latino community today, more than ever, is leery of confidentiality issues. Who would like to speak to addressing any inherent distrust and leeriness from our community, from the Latino community? I mean, I, I would say, I'm, oh, go for it, Dr. Castro. Well, no, I was just going to mention, because, you know, uh, very quickly, when you say the distress of the community, there are things that not a lot of people know, right? In Puerto Rico, back in the 70s, um, the women were forced to sterilize. And this was uh, something that, that was done. And because of that, many, many women don't, and, and even men don't trust in the healthcare system. So we just need to get to what is the base of the distrust. Right, and then the conversation, the open conversation. What are, um, as um, Dr. Mohan said, and I think Lauren, you also mentioned previously, right? It was like 
talk to them about what are these things and, and educate them and explain what we're doing with their data, what we're not doing with their data. And um, something that might be a little bit of a conscious bias, but I know that in for certain people is if they have someone that is uh, from their same background is very relevant and the patient tend to trust them uh, more than it's not and some some say that is unconscious bias on my part for saying it but but it's true um so i think you have to have different elements and once again cultural competent healthcare set systems are are key to be able to build trust She covered it. <laughs> All right, great. Well, now we're going to move to closing statements. I'd like to ask each panelist to give a brief statement, something they'd like to leave us all with. And also, if there's any digital platforms or apps that you guys want to bring our attention to, you know, we've been talking about how powerful this can be. And so this is your opportunity to plug some of that. Um, I will start and go around the circle, starting with Robert Jaren. So as I was saying before, you know, really, this is all about following the money. Um, as providers are able to be reimbursed for these services, you'll see more uptake of these types of digital health tools and solutions. Unless that happens, we won't see that. Um, we have the perfect opportunity now for Congress to act upon making some of the public health emergency waivers permanent. I think that they should. Um, areas to watch in this, um, you know, really nascent but exciting area include things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, clinical decision support software, um, also uh, how CMS, other policies in CMS, not just direct physician reimbursement, but things like durable medical equipment and the creation of uh, potential creation of a benefit category to really capture digital um, health technologies, I think are all areas to really kind of focus on. And I would also look at, at coding and code gaps. You know, the AMA has done a job over the last few years, um, you know, obviously through the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group, of which I'm a part of, um, but also in general to really try to get out to providers and help them understand what these changes are in policies and as well as technology, helping providers know what tools exist and how it can most help them with efficiency and reducing costs. Um, you know, lastly, I would also look at an area called digital therapeutics, which involves uh, apps that help in things like cognitive behavioral therapies, uh, which is also a, a growing field, um, mostly medical devices, but nonetheless uh, software based and, and just very interesting. So thanks again to CHI for having me. So I will say on my end, and as part of my gen, something that for us is key, as I mentioned through through the the time that we have been together, is create awareness um, for Hispanic Latinos, understand the disease, um, how the disease affect them, utilize real world evidence, and also include the voice of the patient in everything we do. Um, some of the tools that we have is the Colgival, which is cognition in MS patients. Um, this is only for the providers to use, not for the patient. Um, and then um, I will say that in the two last minute, seconds, um, I would like to salute all the healthcare professionals that are first line for COVID-19. Um, I just, me quito el sombrero ante ustedes and I just stay safe. Um. I'd like to add, uh, you know, just my thanks to the CHCI and uh, to my fellow panelists for this really engaging discussion. Um, to me, it's more clear than ever that we really have a responsibility to act now and we can no longer bear witness to the issue of health disparities. Um, Impact of the trial I mentioned earlier enrolled um, predominantly minority patients with COVID-19 and met its primary endpoint. It really exemplifies that studies can be more diverse and inclusive, but they can also be operally operat uh, you can execute them quickly in a, in a pandemic setting. So healthcare is becoming more personalized and it's within reach for all, including Latino communities and the population. And this requires a different level of commitment and engagement from all of us, starting with sharing data transparently with patients, even through digital platforms. And it's important to advocate for communities to be part of clinical research if we really want to make sure sure that these patients can see themselves in that future and benefit from that too. And so it's time uh, for significant contribution um, from all of us here. I mean, we have such a diverse panel of different backgrounds and um, different industries representing here. So 
I just want to say at Genentech, we'll continue to invest in this work together uh, with the healthcare ecosystem. And thank you again for the opportunity to return to this summit and participate on this panel. Great. I also would like to, to add my thanks to CHCI and to Alejandra and my, my fellow panelists here. Um, I will just say that I think digital health companies really should be designing their solutions with the needs of the Latino community in mind, and they should be thinking of these needs as stages of designing their product really should be an afterthought. Um, it should be something that's thought at the very beginning and then something we iterate on and continue to improve over time. Um, I'll say, you know, Uber looks forward to, to continuing to help support this community in every way possible, especially on the Uber health front. So uh, please you know, stay in touch and, and let's keep doing some good work here. Right, and very quickly, again, like I mentioned, we have a wonderful opportunity in our hands, but it's gonna take all of the different sectors to come together to make it happen and realize the benefits that, that they have. Our solutions are gonna be in the market very soon from Mila and Lily, and we're super excited about that. And I, if I have a plug is that because of COVID, um, we have been really working on access on how we can help our patients. So when it comes to the people with diabetes, we came up with a new solution of having like a $35 copay card. So if you need insulin, you do not pay more than $35. So please make sure this, if this was just for COVID, but now it is actually a full-time benefit that we're offering. So go to insulinaffordability.com and make sure that you get an um, opportunity to get access to this. Well, I want to give a big thank you to all of our panelists. To Good afternoon. I am Marco Davis, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Thank you to everyone for taking the time to participate in our health summit yesterday and today. We truly appreciate your participation, engagement, and support. I also want to thank our sponsors for their generous support and commitment to CHCI throughout the year. To our speakers and moderators, thank you for leading such insightful, engaging, and critical conversations. We've had two days of rich discussions and insightful conversations about the health and wellness of our community and the nation. We covered so many critical issues, health disparities that exist for our population, the Affordable Care Act, mental health, maternal health, and so much more. We hope you found the discussions informative. We encourage you to continue these conversations as we all work together to improve health outcomes for our families and everyone. In the next few days, you will receive a brief recap of the discussions and access to the sessions to watch and share. The message will include a short event survey. Please use it to give us your feedback about the Health Summit. Your feedback really makes a difference and is vital to help us plan future events like this. Our next event is the Tech Summit on Tuesday, December 8th. Go to chci.org to register today. It's free to participate. Also, be sure to listen to our new podcast, Here to Lead. In it, we talk with Latino leaders about their journeys, keys to success, and how to help develop the next generation of Latino leaders. Our guests so far have included Marcelo Claude, CEO of SoftBank Group International, Oscar Munoz, Executive Chairman of United Airlines Holdings, Maria Contreras Suite, the 24th Administrator of the SBA, and Pedro Pizarro, CEO of Edison International. You can find Here to Lead on all major podcast platforms including Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and Spotify. Finally, because CHCI's mission is to develop the next generation of Latino leaders through professional leadership programs and transformational experiences that we implement year round, we are so grateful for the generous support of our corporate partners to make that happen. We're already gearing up for 2021 and are taking applications right now at chci.org. And if there's one thing that's been made patently clear this year, it's that CHCI's work is more important than ever. We need more Latinos, Latinas, and Latinx leaders in positions of power and influence so that our needs are not overlooked or ignored, so that our contributions to this country are properly recognized, and so that we all succeed together. But we can't do this work alone, and we can't grow our impact without your help and support. So please consider making a donation at chci.org slash donate to support our important work of advancing Latino leaders. Thank you once again for all you do. Continue to stay in touch with us. Follow us on social media at chci.dc and have a great evening. 
CHCI would like to thank you for attending the Health Summit and once again thank our host sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, Genentech, and Novo Nordisk for their generous support.